If you were on a train moving at 100 kilometers per hour and you threw a ball at 20 kilometers per hour in the same direction as the motion of the train, the ball would move at 20 kilometers per hour from your perspective, but from the perspective of someone standing still outside on the ground, the ball would be moving at 120 kilometers per hour. The speed of the train plus the speed of the ball. Simple enough. However, Einstein showed that this concept does not hold for the speed of light. This means that if you're driving a car at 100 kilometers per hour and turn on your headlights, then the light will move at exactly the speed of light from your perspective, as well as the perspective of someone standing still on the ground. The speed would not be the speed of light plus 100 kilometers per hour. It would move exactly at the same speed for everyone in their reference frame. This impacts the way that we can understand the universe because if light is constant in a vacuum, it means that when we look out into space, which is effectively a vacuum, that light that we see has come from the past. And the farther out we look, the further back in time we can see. The night sky is literally a time machine. This leads us to the question, if we look out as far as possible, what will we see? Well, we would see a remarkably uniform glow of low-level radiation in all directions. This is called the cosmic microwave background, or CMB. It's the oldest light in the universe, and it can tell us a lot about its early history. This may look like a random picture of electromagnetic radiation, but the information that it contains is actually quite profound. What is that information on this photograph? And what does it tell us about the nature of the universe in which we live. That's coming up right now. I just want to tell you that I was inspired to make this video after watching a documentary on Magellan TV, today's sponsor, called Search for the Edge of the Universe. It takes you on a fascinating journey from the ancient Earth-centered static model of the cosmos to the modern understanding of a dynamic Big Bang beginning 13.8 billion years ago, leading to the formation of present-day large-scale structures of the universe. You can enjoy many more documentaries like this on Magellan TV. It's a new type of streaming documentary service founded by the filmmakers themselves. Featured subjects include history, nature, science, and technology. You can watch it on any of your devices anytime without ads. Magellan has a new offer right now for Arvin Ash viewers. You can get 30% off an annual membership, and this is valid for prior subscribers too. I highly recommend Magellan TV, but be sure to click the link in the description. Imagine diving into a sea of milk and looking all around you. What would you see? Probably nothing but an opaque, featureless, uniform light all around you. This is analogous to the way the universe probably looked very early on for thousands of years, shortly after the Big Bang and it was expanding throughout that time. Then, around 380,000 years after the Big Bang, a series of events took place that resulted in the universe changing from opaque to transparent. What caused this transition from initial opaqueness to transparency? Although there was a lot of energy and lots of photons were around, they were not free to move much. They bounced around and scattered. The reason is because the universe was so hot at that time that atoms were ionized. This means that electrons were not bound to protons. Both protons and electrons were moving around freely in a plasma state, somewhat like the way they are at the center of the sun. When electrons are free to wander around like this in the plasma, photons can't travel through them unimpeded. They interact with the electrons and scatter. This would prevent the light from one end of the universe to reach your eyes directly. It would be scattered randomly, so you would not be able to make out any features. However, after about 380,000 years, the universe cooled to about 3,000 Kelvin, or 2,700 degrees Celsius. This is still pretty hot, about twice as hot as liquid iron. But the universe now had a low enough energy such that electrons could combine with protons to form stable, neutral hydrogen and helium atoms. At this point, then, the universe became transparent because photons were now free to travel from one end of the universe to the other without being scattered by electrons. One thing you might be wondering is, why is this light from the very early universe microwave light, which is a relatively low energy light? Shouldn't this light be higher energy like X-rays or gamma rays, since the early universe was extremely hot and energetic? Well, the answer is that indeed this light was higher energy or shorter wavelength originally, 
but at 2700 degrees Celsius, it was not energetic enough to be X-rays or gamma rays. It was mostly in the infrared range. In fact, part of this light was also in the visible range, so you would have been able to see it with your own eyes if you were there. However, during the ensuing 13.7 billion years, the universe has expanded. As space expands, since the speed of light is constant, the wavelength of photons increases with this expansion. This results in lowering the energy of the photons. So while the original photons were more energetic, by the time the light reaches us billions of years later, it is of a lower frequency. It's now in the radio wave or microwave region. And these microwaves are coming from every point in the universe. It's like a subtle background glow. In fact, when measured, its intensity to frequency ratio fits perfectly over the graph for a black body. It's the most perfect black body ever measured. What does this mean? A black body is an object that absorbs all incoming electromagnetic radiation. In the ideal case, it absorbs light from any direction, in any frequency, and does not reflect anything back. Since it also absorbs all visible light, at room temperature, it would appear to be perfectly black. That's where the name black body comes from. But black bodies also emit photons in the form of thermal radiation in a continuous spectrum according to their temperature. In fact, all objects above absolute zero emit some photons. This is called black body radiation. So black bodies above absolute zero not only absorb photons, but emit photons as well. Most objects are not perfect black bodies, so they generally don't absorb all the radiation. Objects tend to emit or absorb certain wavelengths of light more than other wavelengths. As it turns out, however, the CMB is possibly the closest we've come to observing a perfect black body. As you can see from the way its measured light fits on this ideal black body graph. The spectrum of photons emitted from black bodies looks different at different temperatures. When we measure the black body radiation from the CMB, we find that it matches the expected spectrum of an ideal black body for a very specific temperature. And that temperature is 2.726 Kelvin, which is about 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. So from examining the CMB, we can figure out exactly what temperature the universe's background radiation is. The fact that the black body spectrum is almost perfect suggests that the temperature is evenly distributed. And this means that the CMB is in a near perfect equilibrium, suggesting the universe was very isotropic and homogeneous when the CMB was formed. This means that the early universe was essentially the same in all locations and in all directions when the CMB was formed. This fact not only gives us a clue about what the early universe looked like shortly after its creation, but has profound implications for the way it looks today. The isotropy and homogeneity has manifested in a universe we see today where the average density of galaxies is the same throughout the universe and does not change much with distance or direction. You might ask, well, if the universe was the same everywhere at the beginning, then why are there any clumps at all? Why are there galaxies, solar systems, and even planets? Wouldn't the universe be perhaps nothing but a sea of radiation or a sea of atoms? Well, although the universe was pretty isotropic, it was not perfectly so. It has a small anisotropy. So this 2.7 Kelvin temperature of the microwave background is not perfectly uniform. It has a very small variation. The temperature of the CMB is more precisely 2.7 Kelvin plus or minus 0.00003, or a variation of about 1 in 100,000. And it's this deviation from being perfectly the same in every direction, the anisotropy, that led to the seeds which have grown to the large-scale structure of the universe we see today. It's mind-boggling if you think about it, but a region that was a fraction of a degree warmer became a vast galaxy cluster, hundreds of millions of light years across, containing trillions of stars. Where did this variation come from? The imperfections that led to the overall structure of the universe are believed to stem from quantum fluctuations in the early universe. The fluctuations led to the fact that some places had a very slightly higher matter density than other places. And over time, this led to certain places attracting more mass via gravity than other places. The structural formation within our universe ultimately comes from this process. Thus, the quantum fluctuations become the seeds leading to the structure in the universe as it expands. But it's still highly uniform. In fact, 
some of our earliest microwave instruments were not sensitive enough to detect such a minute temperature difference. The current temperature of the CMB comes from relatively recent advanced satellite data. But the fact that the CMB is almost perfectly isotropic also gives us a clue about how the universe was probably formed. It is evidence for the theory of cosmic inflation in the very early universe. Cosmic inflation is the theory that the early universe, from only about 10 to the negative 36 seconds after the Big Bang to about 10 to the negative 33 seconds, expanded exponentially from an infinitesimal point to about the size of perhaps a large orange. And following this, the universe continued to expand, but at a much slower rate. Many physicists believe that such an inflationary epoch in the universe explains the isotropy, because it would have stretched out space very fast. This would even out any significant imperfections, leaving only the small imperfections due to quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations, magnified to cosmic scales, became the seeds like the galaxies and the galaxy cluster formations of today. The CMB also reveals that the universe is probably flat. When I say flat, I don't mean flat like a pancake. What I mean is flat in four dimensions, meaning there is no overall curvature to our 3D space-time. Two parallel beams of light will remain in parallel forever. They will not converge or diverge. For example, if the universe was like a 4D sphere, the beams would eventually converge. Just like if you make two parallel lines around the Earth, it will eventually converge at the poles. On the other hand, if the shape of the universe was like a 4D saddle, the beams would diverge. In four-dimensional flat space-time, however, the parallel beams remain parallel forever. How did physicists determine that the universe is flat? Curvature can be determined by gauging how much the CMB light has been deflected or gravitationally lensed while passing through the universe over the past 13.8 billion years. The more matter these CMB photons encounter on their way to Earth, the more lens they get, so that their direction no longer crisply reflects their starting point in the early universe. This shows up in the data as a blurring effect, which smooths out certain peaks and dips in the spatial pattern of the light. If the universe was curved in any way, the temperature variations would appear distorted compared to the actual size we observe with our telescopes. This data tells us the density of matter in the universe. If this density is higher than the critical density, the universe would be closed like a giant sphere. If it was lower, then it would be open like a saddle. Our universe appears to be just at the critical density. WMAP and Planck satellite observations of the CMB confirmed that we do indeed live in a flat, critical density universe. In addition to flatness, the fact that there is a microwave background at all is significant evidence that the Big Bang actually happened. Why? Because this leftover radiation is exactly what we would expect if the universe was much denser and hotter and smaller in its early history. We know the universe is expanding, so it had to be denser and smaller earlier in its history. And we also know that it had to be hotter because as the universe expands, it would be expected to cool down as its thermal energy is dissipated into a greater volume. If the universe was steady or getting smaller, we would either be at the same temperature or we would be hotter. If the universe was not allowed to expand and cool from the time of the CMB, we would still be at about 3000 Kelvin. You might ask, if we can't see further back than 380,000 years after the Big Bang, have we hit some kind of firewall where we can never analyze the universe when it was any younger than that? In other words, is there an information barrier that prevents us from knowing anything about the universe's earliest beginnings? Well, there is hope because light is not the only thing that can carry information. You have to remember that we recently discovered gravitational waves, and we're quickly learning how to detect even weaker gravitational wave signals. Theoretically, there should also be a cosmic gravitational background, in addition to this microwave background. And this may be able to tell us something from the very early universe, if we can somehow manage to detect these gravitational signals and interpret them. So stay tuned because what we would learn would be entirely new information. Who knows what new and profound surprises are waiting for the future scientists to discover. And if you like this video, please give us a like and 
post any questions in the comments because I try to answer all of them. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.